in the uh, second portion of our series on the Sermon on the Mount, just like Jacob said, we started with the salt and light. We started actually the Beatitudes, but the Beatitudes basically tell us who we are, and after that, it tells us what we're called to do. Okay, and so this is serious stuff, right? This is for kingdom people. Nobody else can do this work except kingdom people. And um, this second part on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, at least the title, I entitled this, Encountering God's Word. Actually, the full title was kind of long. It's Encountering the Eternal Power of God's Word. But it's quite a mouthful, so I contracted it and simply did it Encountering God's Word. But I, what I want us to see is that eternal power of God's Word. And so before we continue, let's quickly turn to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask, first of all, for myself, your help as I preach your word, Lord. It's always a privilege to preach your word, but I need your help to be able to do this well so that everyone will not only understand it, but will be able to apply it, and so in, in applying it, be transformed by the power of your word. May your anointing rest on each one as well, those who are here, those who are watching us online. Give them a spirit of understanding and revelation so that the seeds that will be planted into their hearts today will bear fruit even a hundredfold. Thank you, Lord. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, so we are in the Gospel of Matthew. We are still in chapter 5, and we are towards the second third of uh, the chapter. There are two more subjects uh, that we're going to be talking about in chapter 5 over the next couple of weeks. Now the Gospel of Matthew, in case you are unaware, you know that we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each of them have a purpose, all talking about the life of Jesus, but all emphasizing one aspect of Christ's mission. And Matthew's aim, his goal, is to try and prove that Jesus is the promised Jewish Messiah. And that's why it's the first among the four Gospels. It's the first book in the New Testament. He wants to show that all these, um, uh, the, the whole Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, has been writing about and prophesying a uh, Jewish Messiah that will come and save the people. In their minds, it was just the Jewish people, but the scriptures show that it includes the Gentiles. But to save people from their sin and that we might be restored to the Father forever and ever. And so Matthew's goal is to be able to prove that the Messiah had come. A lot of Jewish people today are still waiting for their Messiah to come. They don't believe that there will be two comings. It's just going to be one. And he had not come yet. But Matthew, like I said, is trying to show that Jesus is, that was the Jewish Messiah, still is, that came. And so um, in our message today, I will be quoting a lot from the Old Testament because that's what... Um, Matthew did. Matthew of the four gospel writers quoted the most from the Old Testament because, like I said, he wanted to show that all these prophecies point to Jesus. Okay, and that, so we're going to try and do that. So let's look first at that passage in Matthew 5 where we are right now. And th this is from verses 17 to 20. This is what it says. Do not think, and this is Jesus speaking, do not think that I, I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For amen, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall not pass of the law till all be fulfilled. He therefore that shall break one of these least commandments and shall so teach men shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But he that shall do and teach, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
For I tell you that unless your justice abound more, actually the word justice here is more correctly translated righteousness, okay? For that unless your righteousness abound more than that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now this is an old translation, as you can see. It's the, I don't know if you can see it, it's the Douay Rhymes 1899 American edition. I chose this in particular because a lot of the passage, a lot, a lot of the verses in uh, verses 17 to 20 are actually translated correctly, okay, and compared to the more modern translations. And this particular passage, this that we just read, to this day is still hotly debated among scholars. How do we translate what Jesus is saying? And more importantly, as we translate and as we interpret, how do we apply it? And so a lot of, um, truth to tell, a lot of churches have split because of this that Jesus said. When he said, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, I came to fulfill it. So does that mean that everything in the Old Testament still applies today? Things like uh, the dietary laws, for example. Um, the Bible teaches in the Old Testament that we can't eat any seafood that has no scales. So only fish, only sea creatures with scales are considered clean. Anything without scales, like catfish, right, or, or, or crabs and shrimps, lobsters, these are supposed, these are considered unclean. And the question is, do those laws applying to dietary considerations still apply to us today and many others? Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish it. I came to fulfill. The question is, what does it mean to abolish and what does it mean to fulfill? And what does that mean to us today? Because he fulfilled it, are we free from it? And if we are free from certain um, commandments, like what to eat, what not to eat, how to dress, and so on and so forth, does that mean, how do we know which now are we free to break? And which should we keep? Who makes that decision, right? And what about you shall not bow down to idols? What about worshiping on the Sabbath or not taking the name of the Lord in vain? What about honoring your father and mother and murder and adultery? What about those laws? Are we free to break those as well? Because who's to say that these you can break and these you shouldn't? Who makes that decision? Right? So a lot, of, a lot of churches have split because some say, oh no, we're not supposed to do this. Oh no, you can. No, you can't. Okay, let's just go our separate ways so we don't fight. To this day, scholars and theologians are still um, not in complete agreement concerning this short passage of Jesus' words. Now, this is a challenge for someone like me because let me tell you, I am not a theologian and I am definitely not a scholar. Okay? Uh, it's like you're a pastor and then you're a theologian and then you're a scholar. Right? Scholar is like whew, the highest. And it's like you need, I think, two PhDs and a couple of published works reviewed by your peers. And I am nowhere near that. But... Let's dive in and see what we can learn and what this has to do with kingdom living because that's what Jesus was trying to teach in this whole Sermon on the Mount. So we're going to look at verse 17 again. And there's something here that did not come out in the English, but it is definitely in the Greek. It says, do not think, this is verse 17, okay? Do not think that I'm come to destroy the Lord, the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. The word or the phrase do not think is actually good, but there's a little small two-letter word in Greek called uh, pronounced me. OK? 
Okay, it's not the same me as we use it today. Okay, me means ever. In other words, do not ever think. And what he's trying to say is, don't let it cross your mind. Do not ever think, I came to abolish the law or the prophets. Don't ever think it. Don't consider it. Do not let it cross your mind. Get it out once and for all. Because I did not come to break the law. I came to fulfill it. Do not, what he's saying here is, do not for one moment think that I will break anything that my father wrote that you now call the Bible. And of course, at that time, there was no New Testament yet. Everything was Old Testament. And the Jewish people, they call it the Tanakh. Everyone say Tanakh. With a kh, okay? Tanakh, right? Tanakh really is an acronym. T-N-K, Tanakh. And T is for Torah, the first five books. N is for Nevi'im, the prophets. And K is Ketuvim, which means the writings. All the other books like uh, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, and so on and so forth. Those are the writings. Okay, so the Tanakh really is just an acronym for Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Okay, now he said, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. That phrase, law and prophets, is very important because it actually has a meaning. Right? So the law is Torah, and prophets is, remember the Hebrew word? Nevi'im, right? I did not come to abolish the Torah and the Nevi'im, is what he's saying here. I didn't come to abolish that. And it has a meaning. When he talks about the Torah and the Nevi'im, the law and the prophets, what he's saying is, I did not come to abolish anything that was written about me, Jesus. I didn't come to abolish that. I came to fulfill every prophecy, and there were over 300 prophecies pertaining to the Messiah. He said, I came to accomplish, to fulfill, to bring to pass every single one of those prophecies pertaining to me. And that's why in um, Luke 24, this is what Jesus said. He said to them, his disciples, this is what I told you, and this is towards the end of his ministry, Okay, just before going to the cross, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. I came to fulfill all of this. Actually, he had come out of the grave by this time. And that's why he says, I told you this while I was still alive before. I'm alive now, but before I rose from the grave. I talked to you about me. I talked to you about Moses. I talked to you about the writings of Isaiah and, 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 and Zechariah in particular. These two spoke a lot about the Messiah. That everything must be fulfilled. Now what happens when we, when these law and prophets, when, these, when the word is not heeded by us, Look at Zechariah chapter 7. It says, They made their hearts like a rock hard, so as not to obey the law, the Torah. Literally, the word here is the Torah. Or the words that the Lord of hosts had sent by His Spirit through the earlier prophets. Therefore, great anger came from the Lord of hosts. So we see two things here. We see the Torah written and the words spoken by the prophets. Either way, both are still the Word of God. Whether written or oral, they are still the Word of God. So Jesus was referring to both the words of God that were written down, recorded, written down, and those spoken by the prophets until His time. Now how serious, how serious is God about following the law and the prophets? In Matthew 5, going back to our text, verse 18, he said this, For amen I say unto you. Literally, the Greek has the word just amen I say to you. And what he's saying is this. Let me tell you the truth. Okay, that's really what he's saying. Amen means here's the truth or so be it as God has spoken. Till heaven and earth pass, one jot, one tittle, 
None of these will pass of the law until everything is fulfilled. Now, here's the thing. Most of us today, we have no idea what a jot is or a tittle. Right? Most of us, we don't know that. We just read it and it says, well, I guess it's pretty important for Jesus to speak it. So let me show you what he meant. The word jot is actually the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It comes from the, it's, it's actually the Hebrew word yod. Okay, not word, letter. Uh, the letter yod. It's the smallest letter. If every letter, is, let's say you write it, is this tall, the yod is about like this. It's just an apostrophe. Okay, it's, a, it's like an apostrophe. That's the letter yod, the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet that has the sound of yah, like when you say Yahweh. Okay, it's Y H V H, Yod He Vav He. So there are two Yods, Yod He, uh, sorry, two Hues, but it starts with Yod, smallest letter in the. It, it's Yod means to be. Okay, it's to be, like I am. That's Yod. So God is. Yod. Now the tittle. What is a tittle? A tittle is actually even smaller than a yod. Okay? Let me show you the two letters, uh, the letter resh and the letter dalet. Okay? Can we have that? Okay. This is dalet, which has the letter D, and that one is resh, which, ha which is the letter R. Now notice they look almost alike. The only difference, can we go to the next slide, is that one has extends just a little bit. That little bit is called a tittle. Okay? Because, see, when you take that out, the D all of a sudden becomes an R. And that can be disastrous. Or I could say, that could be disastrous. Right? All of a sudden, it's different. I'll give you an example. The word ram. Okay, Ram means exalted. That's Ram. Dam, okay, the letter D, Dam is blood in Hebrew. So when you say Avram, which we say Abraham, right? Avram, Av is father, Ram is exalted. So Avram means exalted father. When you say Avdam, there's no word like that, but if you say Avdam because someone forgot to ex extend that too much, and it becomes bloody father. Right? And, and that gives a totally different meaning. Because Dam means blood, and Ram means exalted. So you can see what Jesus is saying. Look, he said, this is how... In, this is what, how I value the Word of God. The Word of God is not going to change. It is solid. And even Jesus puts his faith in it. And he said, look, this is how solid it is. That not even the yod will change. And even the tittle, when the scribes copy they didn't have copy paste like we do today they actually had to write when the papyrus would start to uh, crumble they would have to transfer it and write it one by one and if they made a mistake they don't just scratch it out they throw the whole thing and start all over again so if you're writing Isaiah which has 66 chapters and you're already on chapter 66 and you made a mistake, you throw the whole thing away and start from chapter 1 all over again. That's how careful they are when writing. And that means every tittle has to be done properly because it could change the meaning of what God intended to say. And there's some words, if you change it, can really be disastrous. Ram and Dam are just the only things I can think of because that's the easiest to show you. Because these two letters look alike. And Jesus said, none of them will pass away until all is fulfilled. Everything. Not just, the, not just concerning Jesus coming, but Jesus coming again. 
and all the other passages that there are. Let's move on to verse 19. Look at what Jesus said. He therefore that shall break one of these least commandments. In other words, God desires obedience. Do not underplay, do not underestimate the importance of obedience as far as God is concerned. That's why even God said obedience is better than sacrifice. He therefore that shall break one of these least commandments and, sh and shall so teach others to break as well shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But he that shall do or obey and teach others to obey, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now there are there's an important phrase here that we need to see. Okay? The good news is this. That whether you do or break, you're still in the kingdom. Okay? You're still in the kingdom. Those who, those who teach men okay, to uh, break shall be called least in the kingdom. So you're still in. In other words, it's not a salvation issue. But what this seems to tell me is that within the kingdom, there's a hierarchy. There are some that will be least and there's some that will be great. Those who are more obedient will be great. And those who are disobedient are saved but least in the kingdom. Whew. Because we don't always get it right, right? We don't always get it right. And here's the thing. Our obedience is dependent on our interpretation. If we don't interpret well, we will not be able to obey well. So obedience, sorry, interpretation is extremely important. And obedience is also, or interpretation is also dependent on translation. And that's one of the reasons why I took up Hebrew and Greek. Because I really want to check for myself. And it has proven to be quite helpful for me. So the point here is this. It's not a salvation issue. Okay? But I have to say this. Because then you might say, Oh, so you mean to say it's okay to disobey and I'm still saved? No, it's not okay to disobey. No, it's not okay to disobey. Because here's how I think, or this is what I think Jesus meant. Okay? He who disobeys and teaches others to also disobey will be least in the kingdom. And it seems to me that what he's saying is this. You are not deliberately disobeying. It could be because based on your understanding of what the scriptures say, you are misapplying it, but your heart wants to obey. But because your understanding is a little off, and that's what you understand for now. You're also saying, oh, you know what? This is what I think the Bible is saying. And so you need to do this also. And so now they believe you and they're following you. And because you're making a mistake and disobeying, they're also disobeying. But it's not a malicious, there's no malicious intent to deceive. As long as your heart wants to obey, even if you miss it from time to time, Jesus is saying it's okay because you are growing. Remember, it's progression, not perfection. And as you grow and you realize, oh my gosh, mali pala. The way I understood it, this is more correct. So you make the adjustment. Your heart is right. But when you are malicious and you're looking for ways to deceive people, I will question even if you're saved. See? So I think the least and great have something to do with, has nothing to do with your value. Jesus died for you. That's your value. Okay, that's your value. And you're still in the kingdom, therefore, you are of extremely high value. But you can be least in the kingdom, so I think the least he's talking about here has to do with your influence, your status in the kingdom. You're still in the kingdom, but you don't have much influence 
Because if you did, you may be misleading a lot of people. And I have to say this. Jesus is more interested in the state of your heart than in the rightness of your theology. Okay? I just need to say that. I value theology. In fact, in our school of ministry, I teach theology 101. It's my subject. And it's a subject I love to teach. And the application of theology, I also teach apologetics, right, in our school. And I love those two subjects. In fact, starting next month, I'm going to be teaching apologetics in our school of ministry. So I'm looking forward to that. But as far as Jesus is concerned, your heart is more important than your head. You may not understand everything, but as long as your heart is right before God, you're okay. Amen? Your desire to love Him, to worship Him, to follow Him, to serve Him, that's more important than getting everything right. Because no one gets everything right. No one. Except Jesus. So when the Bible says that those who are teaching men to disobey, or not to disobey, but they're breaking the commandments, and they're teaching men to do so, I think what he means here is it's just that they're doing it maybe ignorantly, not maliciously. I was just talking to a pastor not too long ago, and I was sharing with him the fruits of my study in, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the, in the Beatitudes. And I said, this is how I understand it now. And, and as I went through each of the Beatitudes and giving him just a synopsis of each as I preached to you, First thing he said was he slapped his forehead and he says, Oh my gosh, I've been teaching this wrong all along. And so he said, Can I have your notes? And I said, You know what? It's on YouTube. It's better to listen to it. And so he says, Yes, I'm going to do that. And he'll listen to it. Understand, these are not major doctrines. And if we don't agree, on the, if we disagree on the minor doctrines, that's okay. Jesus is not after legalism, where everyone has to believe the way I believe, the way I understand, because I'm the only one right, everybody else is wrong, even the scholars. That's pride. So I think this passage is more about your stature in the kingdom. However, having said that in verse 19, which is this, look at what he follows it, with in verse 20 he said for i say to you that unless your righteousness okay unless your righteousness greatly surpasses that of the scribes and pharisees now listen to what he said you will never enter now we're talking about a salvation issue the first one was not. He says, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. You will never get saved. So the verse 19 is not a salvation issue. Verse 20 is a salvation issue. And this is what he's saying. Your righteousness must exceed. The word exceed there, I looked at it. It comes from the word mega. And it basically means it must super abundantly exceed as in to the max the righteousness of the scribes and the pharisees now unless you have a history you know the history of the scribes and pharisees it might not make too much sense but the scribes are those who write the the word of god transferring it from papyrus to papyrus those are the scribes they're also known as lawyers and so they painstakingly make sure that every jot and tittle is transferred correctly. And the Pharisees, well, the Pharisees, basically Pharisee means separated ones. These are people who have separated themselves from the rest of society for the purpose of knowing God, pursuing Him, uh, 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 studying the scriptures and then teaching it to the rest of the population this is what this verse means they, this is their life work and so the scribes and Pharisees were considered the holiest people 
on the face of the planet. Literally, that's, that's the honor that the scribes and Pharisees enjoyed. No one except God was holier than the Pharisees. And Jesus said, unless your holiness, your righteousness, not just exceeds by a little bit, but by a megabit, unless your, your righteousness exceeds theirs, abundantly exceeds theirs, you're not going to make it in. And that's why the, the, the disciples said, who then can be saved? Who can exceed the Pharisees? That's an impossibility. This is their life. And Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And what he's saying here is, you can't save yourself. You need a Messiah. And that's why anyone that thinks they can be saved simply by doing good works, does not understand what Jesus said. He said, you will never. That means you have no hope outside of putting your faith in Jesus. You have absolutely no hope of getting saved. Unless your faith is in Jesus. This is like that passage that says, depart from me. I never knew you. And we'll get to that in Matthew 7. Matthew 7 verse 23. When he said that, depart from me. I never knew you. Which I think is the scariest verse in the whole Bible. Nothing to me anyway is scarier than to hear Jesus say to you. Depart from me, because I don't know you. And what he's saying is, we have no relationship. I don't know you. Depart from me. And that's why the key is getting to know Jesus. That's why even in our grow materials, in our care group, that's the first book, Know God. See, when it comes to righteousness, God is demanding sinless perfection he's not demanding progression he's not demanding good enough or really really good he's demanding sinless perfection only those who have no sin will make it to heaven well none of us can get saved then that's right that's why we need to piggyback on Christ's finished work because he's the only human being that lived his life on earth having never sinned, dying a sinless death on the cross. And unless our faith is in him, we have no hope in heaven, on earth, and in hell to get saved. Absolutely none. That's why it's never about good works. Because our problem is not our badness. If our problem was our badness, then good works will do. Our problem is not that we're bad. Our problem is that we're dead. The Bible says the day you eat from that tree, you shall surely die. He didn't say you shall surely be bad. He said you shall surely die. And the dead cannot raise themselves. Therefore the sinful cannot save themselves. Because we are dead. It was for this reason that Jesus had to take our place on the seat of judgment. He was punished for our sins, Isaiah 53. And that was prophesied about him. And because he lived a perfectly sinless life, his sacrifice on the cross was sufficient to atone for our sins. This is the only way that our righteousness will greatly surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees. Because it's no longer our righteousness, but the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. So, all of that is introduction. I'm just kidding. Quickly, three points. What is Jesus saying here? What is he saying? First, God's word is eternal. Okay, that's why I wanted to title it encountering the eternal power of God's Word. Okay, God's Word is eternal. Now, when Jesus spoke this in Matthew 5, He had not died yet. 
He had not been crucified yet. He had not died and he had not resurrected yet. So the coming, the resurrection, the crucifixion and resurrection was still coming. Okay? And Jesus knew that when he dies, which not yet, in Matthew 5, not yet, but when he dies, there is going to be a tremendous turmoil and turbulence that will happen that will literally shake the theological foundations of the scriptures. And it was inevi inevitable. So he had to make sure very early on, as he started his ministry, he had to make sure that when, after he rises from the grave and ascends to heaven, and he's no longer here on earth bodily, and after, because here at this point, as far as the people were concerned, only the Jewish people were saved. Nobody else or anyone that converted into the Jewish religion would be saved. Everybody else will go to hell. Okay? That was their belief. Everybody else. But now after Jesus dies, Gentiles are going to start coming in. Non-Jewish people are going to start coming in. And Jesus knew that one day the Bible will be available readily. It's not something that only, only uh, a, a few rabbis would have. And not the whole Bible, just a passage that he would read from the synagogue and then expound on it. And then we just come back next week and hopefully I'll have another passage of scripture. And the one we have, we pass on to another synagogue. But that everyone would have access to the whole Bible even non-Jewish people, and people are going to start reading it, interpreting it, and putting in their mindset and culture into the scriptures and make Jesus or God say things he never meant. He knew that. He knew that the word would get twisted, whether uh, unintentionally or maliciously. But it would get twisted. So here he was already making sure. He says, look, not one thing is going to change. Don't change anything. My word is eternal. It will not change. And so he didn't want anyone to nullify anything that was written by God through the different biblical authors. In other words, God puts a tremendous amount of value in His Word. The question, of course, is, do we value the Word as much as God? See, God's Word will never change. His Word is the final authority in matters of life and faith. It is the final authority. It will never change. It will never grow old. Isaiah 40, verse 8, this is what it says. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Forever means forever. That means even after we die, it still endures. In other words, the word of God is as eternal as God himself. It will never change. It simply will never cease to be. Mark chapter 13 says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words, my words will by no means pass away. That phrase, by no means, literally is never ever. Never ever. It's that, u me, two words, u me. But my words will never ever pass away. Even like a gajillion years from today, if there were no, it's the end of the world, his word will still be. It will never pass away. And I think what Jesus is trying to say here in Matthew 5 is I want you to understand how important my word is for you, for us. The seriousness and the character of his word. So serious that when the Lord returns, listen to this. I never saw this. Okay, I, I saw the well. 
I saw this just a few years ago, recently. So serious was the Lord about His Word that when He returns, He will restore the observance of the Sabbath even for the Gentiles. The Bible says you are not to work on the Sabbath. That's our Saturday. You are not to work on the Sabbath. How many of us work on the Sabbath? We do. See? But he says, no. Look at Isaiah chapter 66. For as the new heavens and the new earth. Now listen, we're talking about God burning the earth and creating a new heaven and a new earth. Right? For as the heaven, as the new heavens and the new earth, that's future, which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. That means all those who have faith in Him will still be alive. Verse 23, and it shall come to pass. In other words, maybe not yet now, but here it's going to happen, that from one new moon to another, that means from month to month, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me. God is going to restore the Sabbath. Why? Because the fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. For the Lord worked for six days, and on the seventh day He rested. Therefore shall you do no work on the Sabbath. Commandment number four. Now how many of us break that? Probably all of us. See? But you're still saved. Praise God for that. Some people have left because our services are not on the Sabbath. Our services are on Sunday, the first day of the week. See? And so they left because we are lawbreakers, according to them. But Jesus said, you know what? You're not going to lose your salvation over it. Now, if the Lord tells us one day, I want the services to be on the Sabbath, then we will obey that's the reason why we observe the feasts. God spoke to me and says, I need you. I want you to observe the feasts. And I said, I don't know how. And he showed me. We went from Exodus 23 to Leviticus 23. And he just led me scripture after scripture. I studied it for, for several months. And then one day I said, we will do this. And we've been doing it now for about 25 years or so. Which brings me to my second point. If God's word is eternal, then by definition, God's word is perfect. How can, how, how dreadful it would be that something flawed would also be eternal. Never to change. Always wrong forever. So for the word to be eternal, it must be perfect. Perfect. And perfect means no error, absolutely pure and clean and wonderful and holy and pleasing and encouraging and life bringing, not death. Some verse, uh, some chapter 18, this is what it says from the Amplified. As for God, His way is blameless. Perfect is the word there. Tamim. His way is blameless or perfect. The word of the Lord is tested. The word there is perfect, faultless, proven. He's a shield to all who take refuge in Him. See, when you begin to understand that God's word is perfect and therefore your faith is in His Word, He becomes a shield of protection around you. Some people don't have that shield because they don't trust the Word. They don't believe the Word. They don't value the Word. The fact that God's Word is eternal means it has to be perfect without flaw or error. And so because His Word is eternal and perfect, it can remain immutable or unchanging. Psalm 119 verse 160 says, The sum of your Word is truth. When you look at everything, see, there, sometimes you read something, it says, how can this be true? Then you read another thing and it seems to contradict that. And we say, you know, the Bible is full of contradictions. No, the contradictions only exist in your mind because we lack understanding. But the sum of His Word is truth. Not just true, it is truth. 
And truth, by definition, cannot change. Otherwise, it's opinion. And every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting, eternal. And that's why in Numbers chapter 23, this is what it says. God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. He will not change his mind. Everything he says, everything he does is perfect. This attribute of God's word is what makes it so powerful. So powerful that Jesus used it against the enemy when the enemy came against him, tempting him, turned his stones into bread. The first thing he came and said was, it is written. He used the word as a shield and as a sword. It is written. When the enemy comes against you, do you have a word to counter the poison of his lie? Did God really say it is written. That means, yes, God said. And that's where he failed. Did God really say, you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Now that was an outright lie. God just said, one tree. And she said, well, no, that's not what God said. God said, you shall not eat nor touch the fruit of this tree. And that's where the devil got her. Because that's not what God said. God said, you shall not eat from the fruit of this tree. And she added, nor touch. When you add, when you subtract, you dilute the power of God and the enemy comes in and trips you. How well do you know the word? How well, when the enemy comes to trip you, to, to tempt you, will you be able to quote the Bible and say, it is written? Yeah, you know, that's okay. Go ahead, do it. It is written, Judas hanged himself. I mean, what are you quoting? Right? You have to have the right word for the right temptation. Don't just quote anything that you... For God so loved the world that he gave. <laughs> Husbands, wives, parents. How would you protect your family from the lies of the devil... If you don't know the Word of God, how can you protect your kids when they say, but mom, dad, all my classmates do this. Son, it is written. <laughs> Mama said. <laughs> right? How can you protect them? You don't even know the Word. And so your family is left to be feasted on by the enemy. Because we don't know the word. It's not enough to carry a weapon or no martial arts. You might be able to protect your family from a physical enemy, but the devil is not a physical enemy. He is a spiritual enemy. And so he must be fought on your knees, praying the word, Lord, you said... When I walk right with you, you will protect my children. You will watch over them. You will cause your name to be great. You said it, Lord. This is not my idea. You bring it before God. The Bible says, bring my word to my remembrance. Not because God forgets. Because he wants to know, how much do you know? You want something from me? Give me a word that I promised you I would do. This is why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. We don't fight the way people fight. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not fleshly, they're not human, but mighty in God. And look at this. For what? For pulling down strongholds. Strongholds are, basically means wrong beliefs in your mind. That's a stronghold. That's the context here. All the wrong beliefs that you learned through the years that you did not know the Word of God, they need to be pulled down. Casting down arguments. Casting down philosophies and ideologies. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. 
Anything that is anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Scripture, you need to know enough to be able to say, that's wrong, and here's the reason why. Isaiah said, Jeremiah said, Obadiah said, Nahum said, Jesus said. That's why that's wrong. Bringing every thought into captivity. That means challenge every thought. And it says, bringing it into the obedience of Christ. So God looks for obedience. And then, being ready to punish all the disobedient kids. Kids is not here, okay? But I kind of just added it. Being ready to punish all disobedience when? When your obedience is complete or fulfilled. That means you have no key to punish anyone while you're disobedient. Get your life right. Then you have the authority to say, don't do it. Now, what about you? No, don't do what I do. Listen to what I say. Okay? No, we lead by example. We lead by example. You're not going to get it right all the time. But what you can, do it right. So what am I trying to say here? This is so important, I had to put it on the board. And it's this. Anyone who doesn't honor God's word, doesn't honor God. You cannot tell me you love God, but you don't spend time in the word. Doesn't make sense. You cannot honor God if you do not honor his word. One cannot take God's word out of their lives and expect to be successfully protected against the attacks of the enemy. Not just against him, but also his family. Is it any wonder that families are breaking apart? Because the fathers and the mothers don't know the word. They don't spend time in the word. They don't study it. They don't meditate in it. They don't memorize it. They don't read it. How can they protect their families? And then we wonder why our kids are choosing unbelievers for boyfriend or girlfriend. The word of God promises in Isaiah 54, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. In every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. Listen to this. This is the heritage of whom? The servants those who serve, those who obey. Here's the thing. We like to quote, hey, no weapon formed against me shall prosper and every lying tongue that rises against me, he shall put to silence. That's true. But this is the heritage of those who serve God. Those who obey God. Not just because you call yourself Christian. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. And my final point is this. God's words bring healing. Now, Jesus did not mention this in the Matthew 5 passage. I really had two points. That God's word is perfect and God's word is eternal. And that's it. End of message. But I wanted to bring this up. And notice I use the word words, not word. The other one is God's word is perfect. God's word is eternal. But here it's God's words. I made it plural. Bring healing. And my point here is that this is the spoken word. Because there's the written word and there's the spoken word. And the spoken, why is this important? Because the spoken word is just as eternal and Powerful as the written word. The thing that the spoken word has is that when he now comes to you and visits you in your prayer closet, as you pray consistently and fervently in your prayer closet, he now comes and speaks to you and it becomes extremely personal. This is not just about something you read in the Bible for all. This is something now, as he spoke to me, this is for me. Look at this in Psalm 12. The words of the Lord are pure words. The word here, the words, 
The Hebrew word there is spoken word. See, there are two words, amar and davar. And davar is the written word. But the spoken is amar. It's like logos and rhema in the Greek. And now here, the spoken word of the Lord are pure words. That means faultless, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, of earth purified seven times. And the number seven, as you know, is the number of completion, perfection. It is completely pure. It is free. The spoken word is pure. It is free of pain and condemnation and guilt or sin and manipulation. When he speaks, it always brings life. Jesus said, even out of your bellies shall flow rivers of living water. How much more, therefore, God? Look at this in Isaiah 55. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. This is God speaking. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Now, why did I add this point about healing? Because all of us need healing in one area of our lives or another. It might be mental, it might be emotional, it might be physical, it might be spiritual, it might be something that happened in your past, something that you are going through right now that's bringing you a tremendous amount of discomfort and pain and hurt, or maybe something that happened even decades ago, but is still affecting you tremendously. God's Word brings healing. No one can put us together again the way Jesus can. No one can love us like Him. No one can care for us like Him. Look at Psalm 107. It says, He sent His word and healed them. It doesn't say He sent His angel. It doesn't say He came down. He sent His word and healed them. And delivered them, I love this, and delivered them from all their destructions. That means anything that is eating them up, anything that is destroying them, anything that is robbing them of their joy. I sent my word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Any handle that the enemy has on you, anything in your past that the devil can use to manipulate you in the present, he says, I'm going to heal them from all of that. So that you now will be free. For what? To do what? To obey God. The one thing the devil hates is when believers become obedient. And they actually believe what God said in His Word. Those are the dangerous Christians. Those are the kingdom of devil, kingdom of the devil destroying Christians. Those are the ones that the devil is scared of. See, if you pray and disobey, he's not scared of you. You memorize the Bible from Genesis 1 to, to, to Revelation 22. But you disobey. He's not scared of you. You even memorized it in Hebrew and Greek. Still not scared of you. One thing that makes you scary is when you become an obedient follower of Jesus Christ. That's where the devil, all of a sudden, insomnia hits the devil. Ulcers hit the devil. He gets scared of Christians who actually believe what God said and then goes out and does it. That's why he sent his word and healed them. We need healing and then we need deliverance from all the destructions of the enemy. And Jesus is here now. He's, there's healing for your body. Some of you need healing in your body. Some of you are facing some kind of medical fear that's robbing you of joy, that's robbing you of sleep. 
Jesus is here right now and he can heal you some of you need healing for your soul some painful memories that's bringing stress anxiety sleeplessness trauma your emotions are frayed your memories are all going in the wrong direction and the devil likes to remind you of how 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 useless you are how worthless you are because of how this person treated you spoke to you and those words are still haunting you today the fear of rejection the stain of rape or molestation dictating to you you are worthless when in fact Jesus died to deliver you from that you are not worthless in Christ Jesus is here right now to bring healing and wholeness and I don't know what you're facing right now right now I just want to minister to you this I want to pray first for those that need medical healing I'm talking about something physical anything from your brain to a dead toenail I don't care what it is God is able to heal I don't know when he'll heal you how he'll heal you all I know is he can and if that's you right now I'd like you to stand whatever it is you might be getting migraines back aches uric acid gout whatever those of you online as well if you need some kind of physical healing I want you to stand right where you are okay? right where you are right where you are the Bible says he sent his word and healed them Father, in the name of Jesus, you already sent your word. It's written. And so now I speak healing. And I say, be healed. Be healed. From your head to your feet and everything in between, especially the major organs, the brain, the heart, the liver, the lungs, the kidneys in the name of Jesus every system in your body the circulatory system the digestive system the reproductive system every system in the body I speak healing even now every ache and pain in the name of Jesus I speak to the bones to align themselves Scoliosis in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I speak to the blood vessels to open up and everything that is blocking the blood vessels to be cleared even now. In the name of Jesus. I speak healing. I speak wholeness even now. I speak life. I come against every form of malignancy, every cancer, every tumor, every mass, everything that came out in the x-rays and the, and the ultrasound and PET scans and whatever it is in the name of Jesus, we speak life. We speak life even now. We speak life. And we receive it, Father, by faith. We receive it by faith. We receive it by faith. Nerves are being mended right now. Nerves are being mended. Knees. There's some here with painful knees. The Lord is healing it right now. Knees are being made, are strength, being strengthened right now in the name of Jesus. hearts are being fixed we were singing a little bit earlier I I, I need was that, I need a heart surgeon or something like that and that's what he is he's he's fixing your heart even now he's fixing your heart in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus thank you Lord we receive that we receive that we receive that
in the name of Jesus every viral infection we say be healed be healed be healed be healed be healed now I want to speak to those that are struggling with things that are not physical any kind of hold that the enemy might have on you any trauma any fear or anxiety if that's you I want you to stand if it's not you you may take your seat but if that's you I want you to stand anything that the devil has used against you every lie of the devil speaking to you that you are worthless you are not loved you are you are less than desired or whatever it is uh, things in your past that you have that has brought you great pain or shame or embarrassment lies that were spoken against you that you are not gonna make it that you are full of fear and and that you're nothing and and all of that I, I I just come against every lie of the enemy even now in the name of Jesus and I speak wholeness I speak wholeness Lord by your Holy Spirit bring healing to their to their minds bring healing to their memories turn every trauma every painful experience every lie of the enemy we nullify it we neutralize it because you have tremendous worth in Christ you are loved by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords you are not nothing he died for every single one of you every single one of you you have infinite worth in him don't ever let anyone tell you otherwise and so I speak wholeness I speak joy to be your strength every lie of the enemy that has robbed you of joy I cancel that in the name of Jesus I cancel that everyone here that has been raped or even those of you online you were raped you were molested or maybe you are the abuser the molester and it's something in your past and it still haunts you and brings you a tremendous amount of, of guilt and shame because of what you did to others there is forgiveness in Christ and if you were the one who received that abuse there is healing in Christ let him wash away the pain by his blood wash away the guilt because in Christ there is no condemnation none whatsoever and when you look into his face all he has is love for you and he says your sins and your iniquities I will remember no more there is forgiveness in Christ so father in the name of Jesus wash by your blood wash wash away the pain Wash away the memories. Transform it, O oh Lord. Transform it. So that that which the enemy used to destroy us, you will use now as a weapon against the enemy. Just as Goliath used a sword against David, David used that same sword to cut off Goliath's head. And so for every pain, everything that has brought you pain and shame and sorrow God will use so that now you can bring wholeness to others as well so I speak life and Father fill them fill them now afresh with your Holy Spirit fill them with your joy 
Refresh their tired and weary souls, O Lord. Refresh. 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 Even now. Let there be times of refreshing as you spoke of in Zechariah. Let there be times of refreshing that will come even now. Some of you here have been or you felt like your parents rejected you or loved you conditionally. They will only love you if and it has brought tremendous pain to you and your sense of worth has been broken. But our Father in heaven says, I love you with an everlasting love. Even before you were born, I had you in my mind and I had you in my heart. And I thought of you and I planned your life and I planned wonderful things. You will bring glory to my name, he says. And so, Father, let them sense your love right now. Let them sense your peace. I speak shalom. Perfect peace. Perfect peace. In the name of Jesus. Perfect peace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We receive that right now. We receive it. I want to pray one more prayer. We're going to ask everybody to sit down. Perhaps some of you here, you have not given your life to Jesus yet. I want you to know that Jesus loves you with an everlasting love. And it's only when you surrender your life to Jesus that you will be saved. And if that's you right now, my friend, I want you to pray with me. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Join me in this prayer. It's a prayer of repentance and surrender to Christ. And if you pray this with all your heart and trust Him to deliver you from death, He will do that. Let's pray right now. I'm going to ask everybody to close their eyes. Let's pray. Join me in this prayer. And if you're already saved, join me anyway because the one sitting next to you just might need to hear someone praying to encourage them to pray as well. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I choose you. I surrender my life to you. Forgive me all my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Be my Lord, my God, my Savior, and my best friend. Thank you so much for loving me and saving me. Teach me how to love you and serve you all the days of my life. This is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to know very quickly, how many of you prayed with me today for the first time? and you gave your life to Jesus. It might not be your first time here with us, but you finally gave your life to Jesus. Anybody here? I just want to know. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Maraming salamat po. Anybody else? Anyone else? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Well, thank you. Let me pray for you guys. And for those of you online, if you gave your life to Jesus, kindly put it in the comments. I gave my life to Jesus. Our intercessors are going to be praying for you as well. I will too. Let me pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, for all those who gave their lives to you today, thank you so much. This is the best decision they can make in their whole life. And if they prayed in faith, today they are saved. And they belong to you. They are your child, your son, your daughter. And they are loved infinitely. So thank you, Lord. Bless them. Even those online, bless them. Everyone that gave their life to Jesus, I release your blessing upon them. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, 
Amen, 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 amen. So let me just very quickly throw to you my bottom line and some discussion questions. First, Jesus did not come to abolish the words written and spoken about Him which we call the Scriptures. He came to fulfill or establish it. If you are a child of God, you are bound to His Word. Second, the Word of God is our final authority on matters pertaining to life and faith. We cannot claim to be God's people and be ignorant of it or refuse to study and understand it or be guided by it. Third, God's Word is eternal, which means it will never, ever, 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 ever pass away. Amen? God's Word is perfect, which means it is free of all error and falsehood, and therefore can and must be believed. And finally, God's Word brings healing to every dimension and time frame of your life. That means God can go to your past and bring healing there, and you sense that healing in your present. Amen? And finally, some discussion questions. First, how much do you value the Word of God? How much time do you spend reading, memorizing, studying, meditating, uh, meditating on and sharing the Word of God on a weekly basis? Not once in a while, okay? If not that much, what do you plan to do about it? Okay. What do you plan to do about it? And second, how much of the scriptures do you turn into prayer or quote in your prayers? Do you think you need improvement here? What's your action plan? Okay, so basically, that's it. We're done. And um, for those of you that gave your life to Jesus Christ, please go to the welcome, a uh, new here. A table as you go outside you'll sit by the big mirror okay and uh, those of you in care groups if you haven't yet make sure you get the no God book because that's what you need to um, use in your care groups so I pray that uh, God ministered to you and that you were blessed today let's all stand God is good amen God is good Let's lift our hands to the Lord so we can receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with such favor and grant you His shalom, His perfect peace. And so unto Him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand in His presence with great joy, to the only God our Savior, be the glory and the honor, dominion and authority in times past, now, and forevermore. This is our declaration. In Jesus' name, and all of God's faithful people said, Amen and Amen.